Hello our viewers, previously on our discussion about rotational motion, we have tried to see about rotational dynamics. Under rotational dynamics, we have key terms like moment of inertia and torque. We have defined moment of inertia as the measure of uh, distribution of mass about a given axis. We have also defined that torque is the cross product of momentum and applied force, so that torque, the maximum torque can be given as force times momentum or displacement r. And at last, we have tried to discuss about the law of acceleration for rotational motion can be uh, equivalently expressed as net torque is equal to moment of inertia i times alpha. So today we'll try to proceed and solve some additional problems. Previously, we have said that in translational dynamics, the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And the equivalent expression of law of acceleration for rotational motion is given to be net torque is equal to I times alpha. And then today, let's proceed and try to solve some problems. In your kinematics concept or linear uh, dynamics concept, for a given object, let's say that you have a mass M. And this mass is pulled by net force at a different distance here. Let's say that it moves from this point to this point. The net force, as the net force is different from zero, as the net force is different from zero, if net is zero, the object will tend to be accelerated. If the net force is zero, either the object is at rest or the object is in a constant motion. But if the object, the net force exerted by the force is different from zero, the object will accelerate. That's why we use the law of uh, acceleration. This object tends to have only a translational motion. Every particle has a linear motion, so we can apply this one. But now in this case, this object tends to rotate. Every particle have their own rotational or turning points. So how do we determine the net torque of this object, then we should have to apply rotational dynamics or the law of acceleration for rotating objects. Here let's have good examples. Let's try to compare the translational or the linear uh, dynamics and rotational dynamics. Well, what is the acceleration of this system? Here you have a system. On this system, we should have to use or to find the acceleration. But one thing, in translational or linear dynamics and rotational dynamics, we do have a pulley and that pulley tends to rotate. In rotational motion, we should have to consider the mass of the pulley. If the mass of the pulley is mentioned, if the moment of inertia of the pulley is given and the like, it should be under rotational dynamics. And if the mass of the pulley is zero or massless pulley, if we use massless pulley, frictionless and so on pulley, it's only translational motion. So there is a combination on highly related between translational dynamics and uh, rotational dynamics. So it's a mixture of both translational and rotational dynamics. The two mass has a translational motion, whereas the pulley has rotational dynamics. So how do we solve that? The first thing is you should have to find the free body diagram of uh, each particles or each components. Here you have two mass and the pulley. Okay, so the force exerted on this mass, like they say that this is mass one, the force exerted here is the weight. We have mass one times gravity G. Okay, there is a downward force exerted. And there will be a tension exerted on this string. There is a single string, there will be a tension exerted on this string. First, let's consider the pulley to be massless. Then we'll try to see if there is a mass on the pulley. In this case, we have a tension in that the string. On the string, we have a tension T. As the object is moving downward, there will be a force exerted upward. Okay, it reacts or it tries to oppose the uh, weights acting downward. So M1G is acting downward, the tension is reacting upward. And here we have an object which is acting on this direction. So the force exerted on this string is the one which tries to pull this mass on this direction. If there is friction, you can use frictional force, but if there is no friction, so the only uh, total force exerted on this mass is the tension T. 
So you should have to draw the free body diagram of this and this for translational. As in the case of rotational body, as in the case of rotational body, as a force is exerted on this mass, mass one times gravity G, there will be a reaction force exerted on the string. And the string has two parts, one on this side of the pulley and the other on this side of the pulley. Previously, the pulley is said to be massless. But in this case, we had we'd have the mass. So you should have to use two purposes. The first purpose of the string on this side is to oppose the pulling, to oppose the weight of this mass. So as the weight is pulling downward, the tension reacts upward. Okay? And the other function of the tension is to tend this pulley in one direction, like in this case, clockwise. To tend this pulley clockwise, there will be tension exerted on this part of the pulley. Now let's come to that of the pulley. As the pulley is tending to rotate clockwise, as it tends to rotate clockwise, there will be a reaction force tending oppositely, or it will react oppositely. The tension exerted on this portion of the string tends oppositely. Let's call it to be T2. And at last here, mass 2 is pulled due to the tension exerted on this portion of the string. So mass 2 is tending to move to the right. Okay? If there is friction, you can use. But it says frictionless, no more friction. So you should have to put the free body diagram of this mass, this mass, and this mass. Previously, in translational motion or in translational dynamics, we just use the uh, free body diagram of this mass and this mass. We don't use the free body diagram of the pulley since the pulley is massless. But in rotational dynamics, always think about there are something additional which tends to rotate. They do have a rotational effect, so you should have to put the rotational dynamics of these two. So one, two, and the additional of the pulley. So here it says, M1G is acting downward. We have 60 Newton force is acting downward. There is a tension force T1 acting oppositely. And here we have another mass which is acting on this direction, which is T2. Okay. During translational equation, we are to use the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. On this object, on this object, there is a downward force and upward force. The combination of these two gives us the net force, and that net force gives us acceleration. So what are the forces which are acting downward? The force which are acting downward is M1G. M1G, the force acting upward, if it is translational, we, we can use just T, okay, as previously. We use just T for only translational. If the pulley is massless, we can use that. So M1G acting uh, downward, and tension T is acting upward. So M1G minus T gives us mass 1 times acceleration A. This is true for only mass 1. And then, previously, you have another mass. Let's call it to be mass 2. On this object, there is a force acting on this direction. Here, we, do have, we don't have friction. It's frictionless. So the net force exerting on this object is mass 2 times acceleration A. This is how we put. So the net force is tension T. We call it tension T. We just call it to be T here. So the tension T is acting on this direction. And oppositely acting frictional force on this direction, we just use a frictional force minus frictional force is equal to mass times acceleration. But we know that the frictional force is 0. So we can eliminate this one. So the only thing is tension T is M2A. We can put this on the tension previously. So we can relate these two. Relating these two equations, it's possible to find the net acceleration if it is translational or linear dynamics. Now the question is, we have rotating objects. For those rotating objects here, we have mass 1. Here we have another mass, mass 2. And we have an additional pulley. And the pulley has its own mass. So how do we solve for such cases? Okay. So to solve for such cases, we should have to use the free body diagram of each. The free body diagram of the two mass, which are translational or linear, and additionally, the pulley has a rotational equation or rotational dynamics. So for the two mass, let's take this one. Again, let's pack. Here we have M1G, M1G is acting downward, so M1G minus the upward force, the tension exerted here is T1, T1, 
and the mass is said to be mass 1a. This is a translational motion. As well, this is a translational motion. So the net force exerted on this object is equal to net force times net force is equal to mass 2 times acceleration. And the net force exerted here is only due to tension T2 m to a. Now the question is, this too is translational, as we have already previously discussed. But the other concept is here, we have a rotating object. So how do I apply on rotating object? Here we have a rotating object, the pulley. The pulley, on one portion of the pulley, there is tension T1. And on the other portion of the pulley, there is tension T2. Tension T1 tends to rotate clockwise, whereas tension T2 tends to rotate it counterclockwise. Okay? So you should have to apply net torque is equal to I times alpha. And we know that torque is generally given as force times R. In this case, we have a tension acting downward times the radius R is the one or the initial torque. So T1, the tension T1 times radius R. On the other side, you do have tension T2 acting on this direction and the radius R. This is the net torque. The net torque acting clockwise and the net torque acting counterclockwise should be differs. That's how we determine the net, work, the net torque. The difference of these two gives us the net torque is equal to I times alpha, where I is the moment of inertia of solid bodies. In this case, we do have a pulley, and the pulley is usually disk. So you should have to use the moment of inertia of a disk or the moment of inertia. Sometimes it might be given as the moment of inertia as uh, a disk for a disk is given to be 1 over 2 mr squared. Or sometimes it might be a hoop. There might be a hollow ring form so that you might use mr squared. Okay? So the moment of inertia of a hoop can be given as mr squared, whereas the moment of inertia of a disk can be given as 1 over 2 mr squared. In this case, if you use it as 1 over 2 mr squared, you can use it as half mass times acceleration a, if it is a disk. Actually, it should be specified. And for the questions to be given, the moment of inertia of solid bodies are usually given. Okay? You don't have to worry. Now, let's put it all together, tension T1 minus tension T2 as a common both. We have R. We can put it R. And we know that the moment of inertia of, let's say that it is disk. If it is a disk, 1 over 2. Usually, we use it as a disk. 1 over 2 mR squared. This is a moment of inertia of the disk times angular acceleration. Angular acceleration can be given as uh, linear acceleration over radius r. Okay? Uh, you might use capital R or you might use small r. It doesn't matter. You can put r here. Tension T1 minus tension T2 gives us, when you put r here, it gives us 1 over 2 mass times r squared into a over when you multiply this r by this r, it gives you r squared. Okay? We can eliminate the radius r. So the equation gives us tension T1 minus tension T2 is half times mass of the pulley. Okay? In this case, mass of the pulley times acceleration a. Okay? So we have the third equation. And it is the one which differs from the translational equation. For translational equation, we only focus on the translational motion, so that's why we use the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we have two different equations. And we have our third equation, which says that T1 minus T2 is half of mass times acceleration. In this case, let's still use a disk. And the pulley is usually disk. We can use 1 over 2 in mass squared. So when you put this, M1G, the first equation is M1G minus tension T1 is mass 1 times acceleration. This is our first equation. And the other equation from the pulley is T1 minus T2 is half of the mass of the pulley, mass of the pulley times acceleration. And here at last, the third equation is T2 is equal to m to a. So you should have to add all this. When you are trying to add all this, you have m1g, okay, put it m1g, but tension 1 is negative in this case, and here is positive, you can eliminate or cancel, you can cancel. The only variable here is m1g. Whereas in this case, you have mass 1, you have half of the mass of the pulley. In this case, half appears as the moment of inertia of the disk is m, half of mr squared. Actually, it's possible to give it as a ring, mr squared as well. Anyways, let's take it as the usual case, 1 over 2, 
mass, time, mass of the pulley times a. Here we have a, a, a as a common. We can take it as mass 1 plus mass 2, in this case, half of the mass of the pulley, okay, times acceleration a. Therefore, when you substitute all, mass 1 is 6 kilogram. It says 6 kilogram on our question. 6 kilogram times 10 is equal to 6 plus uh, half of 2 is 1. We can put it like 1 plus 4. So when you add these two, it gives us 11. Because I just take the moment of inertia of the disk to be 1 over 2. So in this case, it's possible to have acceleration A is equal to 6 C over 11. It's possible to find the moment of, I mean, the acceleration of a system, as a system. In dynamics, in rotational dynamics, it consists the pulley. Uh, and there is a mass of the pulley, and the, the pulley might be frictionless. There might be given the inertia of the pulley. So this is the one which differs from translational dynamics. So, so far we have seen about rotational kinematics, we have seen about rotational dynamics. Under rotational dynamics, we have defined the main terms, moment of inertia and torque, as well as we have tried to deal about the equation of a law of acceleration and apply on a single example. Now let's try to see about work energy and power. Okay? Work in translational motion is expressed as force times displacement, linear displacement. The analogy of Force for rotational motion is known to be torque, tau, times the linear displacement is expressed as theta. Or it's possible to say that we know that the linear displacement can be given as r times theta. If you put it here for a given rotating object, f instead of s, you can put it as r times theta. And we know that force times radius r is net torque. So it's possible to say the net work exerted due rotating object can be given as net torque times angular displacement. Okay? And the other concept is energy. We have different forms of energy. We mainly focus on mechanical energy. Mechanical energy can be categorized into two as potential and kinetic energy. Kinetic energy for a translational object for objects moving or having a linear motion can be expressed as 1 over 2 mv squared. But objects which change to rotate or rotational objects, the kinetic energy is known to be rotational kinetic energy. This is translational kinetic energy or a linear kinetic energy. Whereas this one is, is known to be rotational kinetic energy, r. And it's given to be 1 over 2, the moment of inertia i times omega squared. This is how we determine rotational kinetic energy. And instantaneous power or power can be given as force times velocity. We know that work is given to be displacement over time t. So recalling this power can be generally expressed as work over time t. What I mean is work can be given as force times displacement. Force times displacement. And instead of work, you can put force times displacement over time t. Okay? Work is force times force times displacement. And work power can be defined as work over time t, or it is a rate of doing work. So instead of work, you can put force times displacement over time t. And displacement over time t is known to be velocity. So power can be given as force times velocity. And the equivalent representation of for objects in rotational motion or rot rotating power can be given as instead of force, the analogy is torque. And instead of linear velocity, the analogy of the analogy term or the similarity term of rotational motion is angular velocity. So it is possible to express it using this. So work energy and power can be expressed using those equations. And we'll try to focus on the energy. For a pure rotational object, and there are objects which tend to have both uh, motions, that means rotational and translational, so we'll try to focus on energy. First, let's try to see a work energy theorem. You have a work energy theorem. In work energy theorem, it says that the network then is equivalent to that of the change of kinetic energy for translational bodies. But here, for rotating objects, it's possible to find the network then is still true, the work energy theorem is true, the ch change in kinetic energy. But the change in kinetic energy for rotating object can be given as i times omega final squared minus 1 over 2 i times 
omega initial squared. So this is what we call work energy theorem for rotational objects. Let's try to solve one simple example here. A constant torque of 100 Newton meter is applied on a wheel having a radius of 20 centimeter and a mass of 10 kilogram. What is the work after it makes for revolution? Let's assume that you have a wheel and that wheel is exerted by 100 Newton force and it tends to uh, rotate clockwise in one direction and it makes for revolution. Well, solve this first. Four revolution means one revolution is equal, equivalent to that of two pi rad. Four revolution is eight pi rad. Okay, this is eight pi rad. So how do we determine the work? Rotational work can be given as net torque times displacement. The net torque exerted is 100 Newton meter. So 100 Newton meter times theta is given to be 8 pi rad. So when you put this 8 pi, we can have 800 pi joule, or you can put pi means 3.14, or you can calculate with that. And the other thing is, uh, it's possible to use work energy theorem to find the final angular velocity if it was at rest initially. Let's assume that the disk is initially at rest, then gradually it tends to rotate and rotate, and it makes four revolution. While it makes four revolution, what is the final velocity? Okay. Well, to find the final velocity, we can apply the work energy theorem. And the work energy theorem states that the change in kinetic energy is equal to work, or 1 over 2 times i omega final squared minus 1 over 2 i times omega initial squared. The initial angular velocity is actually zero, since it says initially at rest. Okay, the initial velocity is zero. So to find the final velocity, it's possible to use omega final is equal to root of twice of the work performed over the moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia of a disk or a hoop can be given using uh, 1 over 2 mr squared. But in this case, it says mr squared, so it might be a hoop or a, a ring. So if, if so, you can use mr squared, the moment of inertia of the ring can be given as 10 times 0 0.2 r squared. You have 10 kilogram and you have the radius to be 0 0.2 the wheel might be like a ring. So we can use mr squared to find the moment of inertia. So when you multiply this, you have 0 0.4 kilogram meter squared. That is the moment of inertia. We can find the work, okay? I mean, the final angular velocity, uh, omega final, it to be 112 rad per second. So we can apply this. Now let's try to see for objects having a pure rotation and rolling. Okay. Previously, we have said that rotational kinetic energy and we have a translational kinetic energy. For objects having a pure rotation means the axis of rotation is through center so that the center of mass is not having a velocity. At that fixed point, it tends to rotate. All the points on the rim have uh, their own tangential velocity. Here you have r, r times omega, we have a tangential velocity. Even at this location, every point on the rim has a linear velocity. There is no any additional velocity. The center of mass remains zero, meaning it's fixed there. Okay, it's fixed and tending to rotate. But for rolling objects, the axis of rotation is not fixed. Rather, they tend to roll on a given object. You can see here, here you have uh, something so that you just roll it, so that it tends to roll and roll here. It consists both uh, movements, meaning the translational as well as the rotational. The center of mass has a fixed linear velocity or tangential velocity. It has a fixed velocity as it reaches here. Suppose if it reaches here, it has a fixed tangential velocity. And the points on the rim has a rotational velocity as well as when you are trying to multiply rotational velocity with radius r, you have the tangential velocity. So we can have a tangential velocity. If the axis is fixed here, you can fix it somewhere here. You can have the center of mass of this point at the fixed point have its own uh, rotational uh, velocity. And this will as has its own uh, tangential velocity. The tangential velocity at the center is r times omega. From this to this is r. Now the axis is through this. Okay, And the, at this point, we have twice of the radius r okay, times the uh, angular velocity. It's possible to find such kinds of 
rotational motion. But we mainly focus on pure rot rotational and rolling motion. For rolling objects or rot rolling objects without slipping, there are two types of kinetic energy. And these types of kinetic energy are translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. So for rolling objects, the total kinetic energy can be determined using the summation of the translational kinetic energy and the rotational kinetic energy. It says the total kinetic energy is equal to the sum of kinetic energy translational and kinetic energy rotational. We should have to add or we should have to combine those two type forms of energy. So this concept helps us to find which objects among those objects, if there are three objects released, which object reached at the bottom first? There is a usual question, might be up here. Suppose you'd have a ring here, here you'd have a disc and a sphere. Let's assume that all have the same mass and the same radius. And if you are trying to release all of these three from the given elevation, let's assume that the elevation is H here, so you just release them. So which object reached at the bottom first? Well, to find this, you should have to use a combination of the two uh, kinetic energy. That means you should have to use the total kinetic energy that we have previously discussed, the translational and the rotational kinetic energy. So to solve this, let's take two points. Here, point A at the top, and here you have another point, point B at the bottom. The mechanical energy at the top, mechanical energy at the top, let's say point A, should be plus work done by non-conservatives is equal to mechanical energy at the bottom, okay, at the bottom. That here, let's assume that the, the inclined plane is frictionless. If, is, if it is frictionless, we don't have work done by non-conservatives. We only take mechanical energy at this point and at this point are equal. And mechanical energy is the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy, okay? So kinetic energy at the top plus potential energy at the top is equal to when it reaches at the bottom, kinetic energy at the bottom plus potential energy at the bottom. While this object is standing in reach at the bottom, the height is totally zero. If the height is totally zero, we don't have a potential energy at the bottom. But the potential energy at the, I mean, uh, the kinetic energy at the top, here, kinetic energy is due to speed. We don't have a speed, we just released it so that we don't have kinetic energy. So the only thing that we have is, at the top we have the potential energy, the potential energy due to gravity is mg h, okay? Whereas the kinetic energy, while this object standing and rolling at the bottom, we have the combination of these two. The combination of these two means the combination of rotational kinetic energy and translational kinetic energy. So here, the combination of kinetic energy translational plus kinetic energy rotational at the bottom. And the kinetic energy translational can be given as 1 over 2 mv squared. Whereas the uh, expression of rotational kinetic energy is given to be 1 over 2 i times omega squared. Therefore, we know that omega can be expressed as linear velocity over radius r. With this, it's possible to find an expression with that of velocity and the moment of inertia. Here it says the all the things that we have discussed is here, so that at the end we can find that mgh is equal to 1 over 2 m plus 1 of uh, moment of inertia over radius r squared times v squared. So we can find an expression for the velocity. The velocity of those rolling objects as they reach at the bottom is expressed as twice of mgh r squared over m r squared plus i. The mass of all the three objects are the same, the radius is as well uh, all equal. The only thing it differs is there due to their moment of inertia. The moment of inertia of a sphere is different from the moment of inertia of hoop and the moment of inertia of uh, disk. So we should have to compare with their disk, with their moment of inertia. Keep this that the moment of inertia is inversely proportional to that of the velocity of the object. Therefore, comparing the moment of inertia, it's possible to say that which objects reach at the bottom first, second, and last. So this is what it says. The only thing you should have to compare is the velocity is dependent, inversely dependent with that of the moment of inertia. So from the table that's provided in physics books, 
you have the moment of inertia of a disk to be a matter squared. The moment of inertia of a ring is a matter squared. The moment of inertia of a disk or a cylinder is half a matter squared. And the moment of inertia of a sphere is 2 over 5 a matter squared. You should have to compare all these two. The moment of inertia of uh, a sphere, the moment of inertia of sphere is 2 over 5 m r squared, meaning when you divide 2 over 5, it is 0 0.4 m r squared. And the moment of inertia of a disk, 1 over 2 means 0 0.5 m r squared. And the moment of inertia of a ring is 1 times m r squared, meaning 1.0 times m r squared. All have the same mass, the same radius. So what are you going to compare? Here, the numbers 1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.4. Among these three, which one has the maximum moment of inertia? The moment of inertia of a sphere is among the least, 0 0.4, it says, then 0 0.5, then 1. So the moment of inertia of a sphere is less than, the moment of inertia of the disk is less than, the moment of inertia of the hoop or the ring. So among these, hoop has the maximum moment of inertia. And previously, you have said that, Velocity has inverse relation with that of moment of inertia. If so, the maximum moment of inertia has the least velocity. Okay? Therefore, in this case, when you are trying to compare with velocity, the velocity of the hoop is the least. And the velocity of the sphere is maximum. So the velocity of a sphere is greater than the velocity of the disk is greater than the velocity of the hoop. So the velocity of a sphere is larger than all of those uh, components. Therefore, the sphere is a one which is rich at the bottom. Then the disk and at last the hoop is lately. So this is possible to find this way. So this is what we have uh, for today. Next time we'll try to deal about angular momentum. So goodbye students.